For centuries, computers have been fueling progress and taking human jobs. Many experts say the threat is real and growing. Will a robot take your job? And can we fix the problem with education? Tonight, our guests will explore the future of jobs and education. They'll also take your questions. Our toll-free number is 1-800-543-8242. And our email address is connect at WPSU.org. If you'd like to join us on Twitter, you can tweet a question to at WPSU and use the hashtag WPSU Conversations. Now, let's meet our guests. Dr. Kyle Peck is a professor of education and co-director of the Center for Online Innovation in Learning at Penn state. Dr. David Passmore is a distinguished professor of education and operations research in the Workforce Education and Development Program at Penn State. He's also the director of Penn State's Institute for Training and Development. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you. Nice to be here. Patty. We had an opportunity to, to talk a little bit about this uh, a few days ago. You said, Dr. Kyle Peck, that this is an amazing moment in the history of education, a perfect storm that will change education forever. How so? Well, I think it's uh, people will look back at this <clears throat> and think of it as Renaissance version 2.0. Uh, there are all kinds of technologies that are emerging <clears throat> that <clears throat> give great potential, but that's happened in the past. But what we have now is this perfect storm of different factors that are working together. Well, what are the factors? So we have things like the increasing, some of these factors are good and some are not so good. So we have the increasing cost of higher education right now. Uh, that's been going up and students leave with loan debt and so on. Uh, we also have more and more people heading for higher education. There were about 100 million people in higher education around the year 2000, and by 2025, there'll be 250 million people. So Are more you talking than worldwide? Worldwide. Okay, there's right. 21 million in the U.S. Right, so worldwide. And so it's a, it's a, it's a growing market for higher education. Um, and as I mentioned, the technologies are, are really booming. So we have... We have evidence, too, so it's about technologies and evidence. We now know that people can learn online uh, on their own or supported by peers, and we know that they also like to come and, and that there's, a val there's value in the social experience as well. So what we have is a convergence of political factors, economic factors, opportunities offered by technology, uh, opportunities offered by or, or need caused by uh, parents needing to be with parents who need care at home and uh, jobs and so on. So we have the ability to learn anytime, anywhere, and with or without other people. So the pressures to change the way we educate our citizens is, is real and growing. Right. Now, I, I just want to say, you've been involved in this conversation literally for mm -hmm. decades, this, this conversation about technology and education. Mm -hmm. Give us a little bit of your background and, and, and what brought you to technology and education. Why, why are you so interested in this? So I started out as a middle school teacher, and uh, I started in Pasadena and then Leadville, Colorado, so up in the mountains in a rural district when microcomputers came out. And I had the first microcomputers in Lake County in my classroom, uh, in 6th, 7th grade classroom. And I saw how captivating that could be for students. Not so much when they're taking a lesson, when they're learning arithmetic, but when they actually take control of the computer and do things. So I saw how much power there is in that. Then I had a great uh, librarian in that middle school who saw interactive video. She saw how computers could control video. And if somebody missed, had trouble with something, they could branch them around and give them a remedial thing. So David might get one treatment, I might get a different one, you might get a different path. You might move very quickly through. So very individualized approach. Mm, right. And by the way, today there's another re resurgence of that calling personalized learning systems. Things, programs, uh, companies like Newton and Smart Sparrow and other places are really looking at how to provide people a unique path based on what they know and what they need to know what works for them, what doesn't, um, and it's a, an exciting time. I also, one of the big factors that I didn't mention that I'll just mention, and it's online shopping. Now, it sounds unrelated, but it's changing our expectations of how we, how we receive products. So imagine an Amazon.com-like marketplace for learning. So if you need a leadership credential, you go, you go search for that in an Amazon.com-like place and you see many come back and you can sort them. Think Best Buys now. You can sort them based on price, based on how long it takes, based on reputation. And you're based saying on we can buy our education the same way. Yeah, so right now, I compare it to sort of diet. Right? We can, we have lots of options. We have fast food, we have uh, organic 
you know, home cooked things. We have uh, high end restaurants. We have middle of the road restaurants. And basically, we, 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 most of us use some of all of those things. And it depends on the situation. So imagine that now you have this Amazon.com like marketplace. And you decide, well, this leadership thing is pretty important. I want a really good credential for that. And you see that you can get one from Harvard, you can get one from Penn State, you can get one from Lefty Louis, you know, three-day leadership camp. And you go, you get to see the, the information. So transparency. Right now, we buy these great big degrees, and they're poorly defined, and you have almost no information, and you're making a multi-year commitment. But think Amazon, you, for anything, you can get detail, you can see a picture, you can rotate it, you can see what other people felt about it, you can you know, read the reviews, you can You, you, you put a, a lot in there, and I'm going to yeah. pull some of it out in just okay. a minute. I'm going to take a phone call first, and then I'm going to come back and find out more about David Passmore. We have Rhonda on the phone from State College. Rhonda, what's your question, please? Hi, yeah, my kids are going to be going to college soon, and... Um, I'd like to know what jobs you consider to be the least likely to be automated because I don't want them to spend a lot of money and time going to school if there aren't going to be jobs. David Passmore. Well, Rhonda, that's, uh, that's the, the major question here tonight. I think that uh, parents and, and students and teachers are going to have a hard time uh, kind of figuring out what the uh, future work is going to look like and how to make a really good investment. You know, we uh, we know that there is a lot of money being spent. We know there's a student loan crisis. We know that there are lots of pressures to get, get good education. It's going to be really tough. And so I think that uh, maybe one of the things we, we should know is that most routine jobs, jobs in which you can write down exactly what the steps are, things you can codify, maybe you can turn into a computer program, those jobs are going to be gone in the future. They're not going to be available. And so to prepare for jobs that have those qualities are really, it's, it's kind of, you're not preparing for the future. And those kinds of jobs could be low-skill jobs. It could be also very high-skill jobs right now and high-pay jobs right now. But work is changing dramatically. So that's one thing. You need to really be aware that there are jobs out there that are going to go away because they're routine. The target for automation is routine. Okay. Now, there are other uh, jobs that require, like, non-routine things, personalization. You've got to uh, have interactions. You have hands-on. Uh, hands-on. You know, I, I was saying one time that uh, probably my, uh, if I had hair to cut, <laughs> you know, I, I might not, uh, I'm not going to outsource to some other country my haircut. Okay, that, that has to occur right here. So where there's personalization, where there's hands-on and all those other kinds of things, where there's, where there's a lot of fine judgment, those are going to less likely go away. But they're still risky. We can talk about that as we move on. In fact, David Passmore, economists say that 47% of the jobs that exist today will probably be automated uh, and, and not human jobs in 10 to 20 years from now. Is that an exaggeration? I don't think that's an exaggeration at all. I think that... Um, the pace in which work is being automated is, is really moving along quickly. You know, if you look at the kind of the history of, of jobs, and Kyle and I were talking about this, he said, Kyle says a job is recent, <laughs> the idea, mm -hmm. you know, that people actually went out and kind of had a wage labor exchange. But, but when you look at that, that uh, jobs changed over time. You know, we used to have a lot of farmers. Now we have no farmers. We have a lot of productivity. And that happened over a period of time. But now we're looking at very short periods where there are going to be the po there'll be the possibility that jobs will go away because we've substituted you know, automation for what those people do. Except that in the past, technology meant more jobs. What's different this time? Uh, well, that's what we think. There's no economic law that says that because we automate your job, we're going to create other jobs. Now, that's really wildly open to debate. Uh, and uh, there are many kinds of jobs where there will be other jobs created. There are other jobs. There may be in the long run, in the aggregate, when we add it all up, there may be fewer jobs because we have automation. One of the things I think everybody agrees on is that, is that even if jobs don't increase or decrease, the content of jobs is going to be different. So those new jobs are going to be very different than the jobs we have now. If you're a person who does routine things, your job may not be there in the future. And, and so in the future, there, there will be more, more opportunity, uh, but it's going to be at the higher end. Can we prepare for a job that doesn't even <clears throat> currently exist? 
in terms of education, can we be trained for a job that doesn't yet exist? We do it all the time. It, okay. <laughs> yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, it's, it, it doesn't take long for the things that you learned when you were training for a job to obsolesce. And I think that's true. You can't sit saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn this one piece, and I'm, I'm never going to have to go back to it again. Trained once, live a life with, that, with those skills. So I think that's what education happen. is, actually, is preparation for, <clears throat> not for job, for, that's training, right, but for life. So things like problem solving, things like systems thinking, things like critical thinking, things like teamwork, uh, things like <clears throat> the ability to write descriptively and write persuasively. Those are, that's education. That's not really training. Those things are forever. Those things are applicable in, across disciplines. Those things are applicable for, you know, for probably a couple more decades. Uh, so I think education is preparation that's very, that's much more general mm -hmm. than training. Uh, the, tools, the tools for Rhonda, who just called in and asked about her own case, are very thin right now. Now we know we can go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and you can see the number healthcare of jobs. jobs yeah, how many healthcare promising. jobs? They're going to be they're going to be uh, half a million uh, jobs in each of three healthcare categories. I think we have practical. You know, we have nursing and and other kind of long term care in those areas. There's also retail because there's sales. There's a new yeah. sixty, the new baby yeah. boomer turning sixty five every and, eight. But seconds. those are the kinds of resources that are currently available. But it doesn't tell you much about the content of jobs and how to prepare for the future. Rhonda. And her children and people like her are going to have a hard time getting the right information to make good choices to invest in the education Kyle's talking about to get, yield good work. I want to come back to that in just a moment. But if you're just joining us, I'm Patty Satalia, and this is Conversations Live, the future of jobs and education on WPSU-TV, WPSU-FM, and WQLN-TV in Erie. Our guests tonight are Dr. Kyle Peck, professor of education and co-director of the Center for Online Innovation in Learning learning at Penn State, and Dr. David Passmore, distinguished professor in the Workforce Education and Development Program at Penn State. Our telephone number is 1-800-543-8242, and our panelists are ready to take your phone calls. If you'd prefer to email us, our address is connect at wpsu.org. You can also join us on Twitter. Find us under the address at WPSU and use the hashtag WPSU conversations. Now I want to get back to this uh, Amazon.com marketplace for mm -hmm. education. I think a lot of people may not even, if, if you graduated from college 20, 30 years ago, you may not be aware that there are universities online, Udacity and uh, the Khan Academy and uh, the Western Governors, uh, I think, University. Mm -hmm. So all over there are <clears throat> opportunities and ways that people can never go to a university mm -hmm. but get the education. Tell, tell us a little bit about what's happening and, and, and how well it's working. Or well, not working. So you, you crossed a lot of boundaries okay. there in your, in your description. So Udacity is one of uh, several MOOC providers. Those are massive open online courses, M-O-O-C. And by massive, it means they can enroll large, huge numbers. This is an online course it's that for the most course. part, they're free? They're free. That's where the open part comes in. Open means you don't have to pay and there's no, like, you don't have to send in a resume. You don't have to have an, a GRE score or an SAT score to get in. You don't have to send your GPA. It's just, you know, name, email address, press here to register. And you're in a college level course. And what kind of a course might you be able to take? Oh, there are thousands there, you of them. You name it, right? Okay. So there are, I think, thousands, but certainly every category. So they, they signed up. 250 universities. Coursera was the first big player in that, but now there's edX, which is a combination of MIT and Harvard, uh, at the core of that with other partners, and uh, they they bring in prestigious universities. There's one called Future Learn that's uh, really mm -hmm. sort of centered in the UK. I mean, they have universities from all over, and these are people who are saying, you know, there are many, many, many people in the world who cannot afford or cannot get to a college level education, and so they take. Uh, what, what you might think of as traditional lectures on video and chop them up into shorter segments and put them out there with little quizzes afterwards and you can learn a lot that way <clears throat> but there's and that's a good thing that's a good thing so think of intro courses like introduction to X chemistry introduction to physics computer science 
those things are that where you're really learning about the field and learning the basics of the field, those are great candidates for massive open online courses because they're about knowledge and comprehension. I'm doing this because there are hierarchies of learning outcomes where as a base you need knowledge and you need to understand things. But then to really be functional in the world, you have to apply those things and you have to be able to synthesize information and you have to be able to evaluate and you have to be able to create with that. So there are all these different levels of things we can ask students to do. And these massive open online courses are great for the low level things. The rub is for the gen ed for the type gen courses. Ed stuff. The rub is that's where a lot of the money is made that's in the university. That's the bread and butter. So that's where you have 300 students in a in a class and somebody talking to them, and you have you know discussion groups afterwards. But that's where a lot of the universities create the revenue that it takes to do a lot of the other things universities do, which are of great value. So, but if somebody was never going to come anyway, it's not really revenue lost, right, to a university. And we're just doing good things for the world. And I, for one, and the people behind the MOOC movement sincerely believe that an educated world is a better world. It's harder to hate people when you understand the way other people work. It's harder to, it's easier to get out of poverty when you have an education and so on. So they're, they're, this is coming from a very noble place. Well, well, the interesting thing about MOOCs is that on one hand, you've got a, a lot of people saying that this is going to be uh, uh, the death nail for mm. for universities that w that it's going to be an enormous challenge for uni universities going forward. Um, uh, but if you s hundreds of universities were surveyed, and forty percent more said they are going to start offering uh, MOOCs at their institution. Mm -hmm which says on one hand we're very worried about what this means for our institution, on the other hand we're going to provide them as well. well. So there are different motives that universities have for offering MOOCs. So one is name recognition. All right, first of all, they started, these organizations started by gathering prestigious institutions. So every university wants its name to be among the Stanfords and Harvards and MITs and you know Berkeleys and those and Penn States you know we want to be in that they want to be in that list also when you have 130,000 people sign up for a course uh, then 130,000 people know your name and if they have a good experience and think of you in that subject area and then they decide they want a degree chances are good that you're going to attract students into your degree programs so it's kind of like the the sale item at uh, the store of your choice, where they mark something down so you come in and then you buy that, but you buy other things. So this is, like the, in marketing, they call that a loss leader, right? You, you give something away to bring people in. So some are using it for that. Others are saying, hey, wait a minute. Uh, this is, I first heard this at Duke University when I went down to talk with them about uh, their massive open online courses. And they said, you know, we're in the education business and this is an innovation in our business. And we're a research institution. Shouldn't we be doing research at the core of our own, you know, our own occupation? And so we have an obligation to study these things. And I think the good news is that we probably can uh, do it all. We probably can give away a lot of good instruction and do good things in the world and still focus on those higher order things. These are the things that, that it, David would require. Would, he described, you know, the things that require interaction with another human being. So learning the knowledge, that doesn't ha have to have a person. You can get something from a textbook and a video. But when it comes time to actually be developing expertise and having someone critique your work, you know, and do these higher order things and working in teams to make something happen, now all of a sudden the university becomes extremely relevant. So what's going to happen is we're going to be replacing teachers, getting away from the lower levels and focusing on the upper levels, still charging people for this experience and having more people able to take that. David. I, I think what, there's quite a few features of work that map onto what Kyle's talking about. Let's just take the, the for instance, of an orthopedic surgeon. Okay. Uh, if you're going to become a surgeon, you're going to become a physician, I want you to know anatomy. Okay. I think you should understand osteology. You know, there, there are four types of bones. You ought to be able to tell me all the little protuberances and things on those bones. I don't want you to point to my knee and say, we're going to cut that. I want you to know what it is. But knowing what things are, are things that can be learned in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. And you may not need, you know, some, uh, you know, particular relationship with a professor to do that. But then extending that a little bit farther, I mean, I might learn how to cut somebody open and replace a knee. Okay, I could, maybe I could learn that in six months. We try. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, 
I can't be a physician because the tacit knowledge, the things that are hidden, the things you can't see, the things that you need to know, the complex things are only done by experience, observation, uh, working with a tutor very closely. And so when I have a patient in front of me and I'm going to replace that patient's knee, that patient might have diabetes, they might be obese, they might have a variety of difficulties, and they might try to I, die on the I, table. I, I should okay? mention, though, that there's already automated surgery. Yeah. There's a, a bot yeah. known as Da Vinci. Sure. Well, that's, that's the automation part of the surgery, yeah. But the, but the idea of treating this, this patient holistically, you don't get that by studying a book. Uh, you get that by, you know, in this traditional medical school, you know, see one, do one, teach one. And you have this close interaction. So this kind of maps back on to some of the things that universities can do really well, which is provide those experiences, provide those observations, provide that guided practice that you only get from other interacting with other people. So that the workplace kind of models what the university does best, too, I think. That, that brings me to this whole idea of the flipped classroom. You know, mm -hmm. traditionally, the, the instructor, the professor, the teacher is the sage on the stage uh, lecturing to students. In the, in the flipped classroom, that reading is all happening at home, and you're coming back mm -hmm. into the classroom to solve the problems and to engage and learn from, as you said before, learn from the master. Yeah, if you think about it, it made sense <clears throat> to have the instructor be a lecturer way back when schools were created, when very few people could read and write, and pe smart people knew it, and they gathered groups of people and told it to them because books didn't exist, computers didn't exist, video didn't exist. That makes sense. Today, it's, it doesn't. In fact, it seems backwards. Because what we do now, <clears throat> students come in, we talk to them, and then they go away and try and do it, right, without the support that they would have if they tried to do it in the presence of the expert. So the flipped classroom just says, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, let's think that over. You know, let's go ahead and allow people to <clears throat> learn it on their own. They can stop it. They can back it up. They can do it again. They can, if that's not working, they can find a different video or whatever. And then once they sort of have the basics, and you can test them to make sure they're ready, bring them in and let's do, do things together under the guidance of the expert. And let's really sort of turn that whole thing on its head. Yeah. How do you respond to this, though? 78% of 1,000 students who were surveyed said, even though uh, online coursework is, is more and more available, more and more classes are available, they prefer the face-to-face -face interaction in a traditional classroom. They should, and I do too. And that's, that's okay. And, and you should be able to, if you can afford that, you should be able to do that. And I think people will always want to pay for that if what they're getting is interaction and not lecture. So the face-to-face -face thing is, can be magical, can be absolutely outstanding. And that's a, 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 something we will be selling for quite some time. So they're not wrong about that. But there's also an element that to be successful on one's own in online learning, it takes a lot of self-regulation and determination and a lot of people aren't good at that so they need to come to a class because that way they know they're from nine to ten o'clock hopefully not eight to nine o'clock nine to ten o'clock maybe they're going to be there and they're going to be sort of forced to pay attention to this thing right now but if you have a self-regulating learner out there um, a lot can be done and so i think there's always going to be a preference for the group-based thing uh, and if you can afford it go for it well, David Passmore, there are lots of people who say there are currently 4,700 colleges and universities that are, are degree-granting institutions. And there are some who say in 20 to 25 years, a lot of them will disappear. Do you agree? And if so, how many and why? Well, I think we're really poised at this moment for an act of what economists call creative destruction. Okay? We have kind of this traditional uh, bubble of cost. We have this incentive people are beginning to question what the price quality is of a college education. And I think that that's going to create the kind of tension that's going to be necessary to destroy the university as we know it. I, I hope after I retire. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but destroy the, the way we think we do this, and it's mm -hmm. going to put us out into the market 
the, the market for learning, the market for assessment. And universities are going to have to change. In the past, they existed in a region. They competed regionally. You went to this university. You couldn't go too far. The advertising was all in the region. But now everything is out on the net. Everything is global. So we see all of that, and there's a lot of competition out there. Things are more visible. You can choose from one to the other. That was the start, and universities still felt like, say, well, we're the only way you can do this. Well, that's changing. There's going to be a lot of pressure in terms of costs, what employers think, and what the possibilities of innovation are going to bring to this marketplace. I think we're going to see creative destruction. To put another spin okay. on that, <laughs> I'll quote uh, Paul Welliver, one of the professors here that uh, I came to Penn State to, to follow. Paul Welliver said, uh, any teacher who can be replaced by technology should be. So if you think about that, there are things that technologies can do or teachers can do. And then there's some things only great teachers can do. For and example? If, well, for example, inspire someone. Give someone a book off your shelf. You know, create a great discussion. Do what you're doing with us right now. You know, ask good questions and cause people to think. You know, that sort of thing doesn't happen through a video. It doesn't happen through reading. Uh, and so if a teacher is just doing things that media can do, you know, as David said, watch out. You know, you're, that job is routine. That job can be automated. But, uh, you know, it, it really, a great teacher will not be replaced. No. You also say, and I don't want to do a reset in just a minute with our phone number, but you say that the preferred credential is not going to be the diploma in the future. It's going right. to be badges. First of all, what is a badge? Okay. So digital badges... Now, we all know what a badge is. It's a little graphic icon that represents an accomplishment. I think Boy Scouts when you say badges. Right. And most people do. And that's, uh, that's one, that's the old version of badges. Today, a badge is a graphic online that when you click, it displays information. It displays really important information. It displays information about the name of the badge, where it was issued, the date it was issued, what you had to do to earn the badge. It can even put a link out to the, to the evidence that was submitted to earn the badge, maybe a video of a presentation that someone did or a video of a team meeting that they led or, 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 and maybe even a, a link to the rubric that was used to assess that. And so are employers going to badges? Employers are, are moving slowly to badges, some more quickly than others. AT&T uh, has made a statement they like badges and so on. But so if you think about it, our, our grading and reporting systems are from the paper and pencil era. They are decades if not centuries old. In fact, the diploma is called a sheepskin for a reason. It used to be printed on sheepskin, right? And so these are antiquated things. Kyle Bowen, one of our, uh, our colleagues in uh, ITS here at Penn State, put a, puts up a slide of a transcript. If you just picture a transcript with <coughs> rows of co course abbreviations, intro, in des, and all that, and letter grades, and then he, he overlays on that a Walmart receipt. And they look and indistinguishable they look almost. The he says, this is, this is really what we're doing is we're sort of like using the receipt kind of a metaphor, whereas these digital badges have really, they're chock full of information, good, actionable information. If I'm hiring somebody and I care about leadership and I care about teamwork, I should be able to see these credentials and see the evidence and then ask people about that as opposed to just saying, so you got a bachelor's in what? You know, doesn't everybody? You know. And what what do you know? What can you do? Right. And so the badges can be combined in different ways, too. Some that I got from Penn State with others. and Yeah, these are often called micro-credentials, you know, because when you put think of a badge, you might say, well, I might have to wear them around like my, my war uh, hero medals. But uh, the, these credentials, employers and also their organizations that are working, kind of aggregating things for employers, are really looking at kind of micro-skills. Can you do this thing? Can you use a micrometer in this way? And th these kind of things aggregate up into, into jobs. And they're portable because it, this just isn't a transcript that you took differential equations and you got a B in it from this place. Well, is that the same differential equation score? Is, is the B the same? Credentials have this kind of documentation about what the criteria What it are, took to get it. What it took to get it. It might even display what you did to get it. And that's really compelling in the marketplace. And to put those things together in ways that are that are, have relevance for current jobs are really important to employers. And another element to the badge that's being added now is called a layer called endorsements. So imagine if Boeing endorses a particular set of engineering badges, then all of a sudden you, you know that says something about the quality. Or if the American Education Research Association, you know, endorses badges about educational research. And, 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 and. Then all of a sudden, now you have these high-quality uh, endorsements, so you realize there's quality there. 
One of the things I think is transformative about this is that's going to raise everybody's game, right? So if the American Education Research Association, uh, if it endorses our qualitative research badge, our case study methodology badge, then you know people are going to say, "Ooh, that's a good one." And other people are going to say, "What are they doing?" And they'll be able to see the criteria. They'll know what we're teaching. They'll know how we're measuring it, and they'll go, "Ooh, I need to, I need to make mine better, so I can get those endorsements, so I can compete." And so right now, it's a, it's a, it's a black box. Everything we're doing is a black box, and this transparency can really change reputations rather quickly. These reputations that took centuries to build could be shifting in decades. Hmm. Hold that thought. I'm going to come back to it. But if you are just joining us, I'm Patty Satalia, and this is Conversations Live, the future of jobs and education on WPSU-TV, WPSU-FM, and WQLN-TV in Erie. Our guests tonight are Dr. Kyle Peck and Dr. David Passmore from Penn State. If you'd like to call us, our telephone number is 1-800-543-8242, and our panelists are ready to take your phone calls. Uh, oh, I... Uh, I can't even read my own writing. Um, getting, I've, got, I've getting, got a question for David. Okay, okay. ask him. So, David, uh, we've talked about Watson and the kinds uh -huh. of jobs that might be changed. So it's, is it just really the mechanical, mechanized jobs, or what, what about the well, higher order jobs? Well, let, let, me add, let me add a little fear <laughs> into the conversation here. We've talked so far about everybody can see, well, if you can really kind of write down your job, it's really ripe for automation. But the next wave that's coming along are those other kinds of jobs where you think that they're never going to be touched by automation. And things are happening. Driving, for example. Yeah, but, I mean, 15 you know, years and, ago, and, that and, seemed impossible. You know, now it's almost boring. Right now, we, we spend a lot of time. There are lots of people who are sitting down writing code, doing analyses to figure out exactly what, what we can do and how we can automate that. But also, the next wave that's coming along would be things like machine learning. Rather than writing the exact instructions, you tell the machine to find out how to do it. And through experience, ex successive approximations and feedback, it does it. I saw one the other day, just to give an example of this, of a, of a robot. And by the way, robots don't have to look like something out of, you know, they have hands and arms, and they can do all kinds of things. But this particular robot, think about this, sorted clothes that came out of the dryer. <laughs> Now, it turns out to be a very complex kind of a thing to do. But the way the robot learned this is it, it, saw, it watched somebody do the job. It tried to do it. And then after a little bit, through machine learning pattern recognition and this experience, pretty soon it's, uh, it's untangling this and even folding the laundry. How do you like that? I can't even do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And, of course, robots can much more quickly than a human could uh, realize what, yeah. what drug interactions there yeah. can be and, well, and is, assist a physician. This is Watson. Everybody knows Watson, right? Watson uh, was on Jeopardy, and you were, you were amazed that he won a lot of money. I don't know what he did with the cash, but he, he won a lot of cash. <laughs> That's Watson's play day. Watson's day job is medicine. Okay? Watson is learning all about medicine. Watson is acquiring a lot of information right now so that Watson can help diagnose and, pres and prescribe uh, uh, medical interventions. And this is a very difficult task. There are drug interactions. There are all sorts of things. There are new things that are coming down the road. Watson's learning those things. And Watson is doing the complex work even beyond what uh, maybe a single or even a team of physicians could do in this case, because Watson can look in the literature. It can do analyses of how, what the trends are. It can find out new, you know, let's say drug interactions. Uh, uh, Watson could things. replace a whole team of lawyers well, who are going through depositions. Yeah. And, well, and this is happening right now. Right now, a lot of legal work is being done by computers. There isn't a lawyer sitting down reading billions of uh, pages of brief. You might be surprised in your local newspaper, you might have an article about, a, let's say, a traffic accident. That article may have been written by a news bot, wow. not a person at all. And this happens. There is a, there is a company. That might explain that, why sometimes yeah. it doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it gets it better. But, but there are news, uh, there are bots that right now that write news stories. They analyze wow. stocks. They uh, flag fraud. 
What, these are all things people used to do, and they, everybody thought that those are kind of complex actions. But their machines are learning how to do that. The learning by machines is the next wave of kind of more than automation, just parroting what we do. So does this mean that that 15-hour work week that was promised to us back in the 1930s might actually happen? Not to Americans, I don't think. I just, <laughs> no, I, I really, I, you know, I don't know exactly what that will mean for the work week. And I don't know what it will mean for the amount of work that we'll have, but certainly it's going to change the content of work. You know, one of the ways that people describe Watson is that he used to think that a, a physician would get some aid from a machine to help in diagnosis. Now the machine may have the physicians go out and say, hey, get some blood. I can't do that. So go out and get some blood for me. I get this sample or talk to the patient. So it might be... Um, Physician assisted, right. <laughs> Watson. Well, yes. well, let, let me ask you this, uh, Dr. Kyle Peck, the Chancellor of WGU Texas, which is uh, the Western Governors University. It's an online uh, university with 32,000 students. The, the Chancellor says that creating a more engaging and useful learning environment, uh, uh, that, that it's always, it's it's constantly getting stuck. And, and he says the reason is that, that students are not demanding uh, certain things and that students need to step up. They need to uh, get on purpose. They need to engage and they need to be tenacious and demanding um, right. of, of those delivering this education. Yeah, so we've had this monopoly on the only credential that really matters. So higher education has had the only, been the only one who can deliver degrees. And so we've made all kinds of self-serving rules like about how many credits you can transfer in and whether you even get to, to test out of courses and things like that. So uh, if students really understood how much power they could have, uh, education would get a lot better. And I think one of the things that's going to change in the near future is the focus will shift from teaching to learning. Uh, we won't talk about teaching and learning. We'll talk about learning and teaching. And we're going to redefine the roles of teacher, technology, and learner concurrently starting by asking the question, what is it that learners are going to need from us? Okay, right now, they need that degree. But that degree, to me, seems rather like a baseball card. You know, maybe I paid, I didn't, I didn't. But, you know, <laughs> maybe someone paid a lot of money for a particular baseball card. That only has value because other people say it has value. So this degree, this monopoly we've had, is based on this great big package that takes years and you have to move to a place and you have to do... Well, that doesn't have to happen anymore. And the another one of those trends I should have mentioned in the, in the perfect storm is the workplace is less and less enchanted with the quality of graduates and their ability to do the kind of work that they're requiring now in these workplaces as it moves up that hierarchy. So, yeah, I think that this puts us into a situation where universities and, and people who are helping with learning and with assessment are in a market. This really doesn't hasn't existed before. We staked this out. We said, here's what you do. Come on in. Give it a try. But now if you're in a market, you have to compete. So it doesn't matter who you are. You don't have to be a prestigious institution. You have to deliver great opportunities for learning. That could happen anywhere. It could happen even not in an organized institution. You And, and in that, the other case, in terms of assessment, it's no longer to say, well, here's your degree. There you go take it out and do good. It may be that the assessments then also, some company or, or, or employers or other groups might look at assessments and say, well, this assessment over here really requires you to do something and to mm -hmm. demonstrate something. I like that. This one over here has you read, as Kyle often says, read, uh, read three articles and write a and paper. Write a paper, right. Yeah. right. And but one of the things that Western Governors University is doing that's leading to the success that they're experiencing is they're, they're a competency-based uh, they have a competency-based approach. They say, we don't care where you learned it. If you can pass our tests and... Prior and, learning counts. Right, you can and, get credit for it. Prior learning, or even, even if you just want to go out and learn it on your own and come back in, even if you don't know it when you sit down to take the course, they'll give you some access to some resources, but they don't care whether you've learned it, where you learn it. But they, but they do know what they care about, and you have to deliver that skill. So people can make r rather rapid progress that way. And there are all kinds of new marketing schemes where you can pay... Uh, you know, $1,900 and earn all you want in this period of time. I mean, learn all you want in this period of time. So it's all you can learn for this price. Or you can pay a price and take as long as you need to learn it, which we, we put clocks on people and, and we do a lot of things that are really counter to what we know about how people learn. So these competency-based programs like uh, University of Southern New Hampshire University 
and uh, Western Governors University, these are competency-based programs. They're growing at like 30% per year, 30% per year. That's like uh, doubling in two and a half years. I, I want to come back in a moment and ask what this means for teachers and for professors, but first I'm going to go to an email. Uh, this one from Matthew, he says, I feel that little will be left for those that fall between the cracks. I understand that humanity has entered an era of transition to automation, but what is in place for those that do not have the ability to adapt? Social services are being eroded, and where do those people go? Homelessness is an epidemic not being addressed by training and, quote, jobs. David Passmore. I think he's right. And <laughs> also, I think that uh, there's never been a better time for people who have adaptive skills that are going to allow them to learn and grow. Also, there's never been a worse time for anybody who has ordinary skills, okay? And that's a reality. So if you you know, the chances of falling through the cracks are going to be greater for people who don't, aren't ready to be adaptive in, in the future. Speaking of adapting, I want to get to this teacher question and then to Walter, who's calling from Warren. But you said, a lot of teachers feel threatened by all of this. And, and it's a fact that, that tenure is in decline, that there are more and more adjunct professors at universities, and, and some people think that's good and others think that's terrible. But you talk about replacing teachers, re-hyphen place. Right. Explain what you mean by that. So I, I talked about this hierarchy of learning outcomes where you have knowledge and comprehension at the, at the base. You know, they're necessary for success in the higher order things, but if you, oh, that's all you have, as you said, if you have ordinary skills, you know, that doesn't get you very far. But higher up that hierarchy is when you actually apply what you've learned and you think you use it in new ways and you, you uh, create with it. So those are the kinds of things that's moving up the hierarchy. So when I say replacing, I don't mean replacing, like they're, they're gone and technology's in. I mean letting technology have those low levels and replacing teachers, moving them up into the higher order skills the creativity, the problem solving, the critical thinking, the application, the idea generation. <clears throat> that's, where, that's where we, for the foreseeable future, uh, will be ahead of the machines. That's, where, that's what we are needed for. All right. We're going to go to Walter, who's calling us from Warren. Go ahead, please, Walter. You're on the air. First of all, let me thank you for taking my call. And uh, my question has to do with not so much the higher education that I think you're uh, your guests are speaking about, but on the, the more elementary school level, specifically the common core uh, techniques of evaluating not only students, but I think they're also evaluating teachers in this regard. And it, it, it sounds like you're, I'm, I'm just kind of curious to hear what you guys have to say about that. About the common core, uh, Kyle Peck? Yeah, so standards are good. Uh, you know, we, we should we should know what we care about, what people need to know to be successful in the world. Uh, but again, it doesn't end there. And, and the, some of the standards are written well where they are focused on higher order things. The problem is we have a group-based approach, Walter. And so right now we're trying to take everybody as a group through these things. And so there are some people who already know it, and they're bored silly. And there are some people who can't possibly learn it because they don't have prerequisites. Uh, and so what needs to happen is we need to get to this personalization, this individualization where teachers are there for kids and they're able to be more like doctors and that they diagnose issues and they prescribe, you know, things for students to do to, to meet that. And then they, they let them run and they inspire them and they're there for them and so on. So we need a, that's what I was talking about when I talked about the redefining the roles of teachers and students and technologies together. So standards, you know, are just basically think of it as what we think kids need to know. And I like the idea of every school should have this common set. I mean, there's a reason why we have public education and why we fund it publicly, because there are things that we think as a society people ought to know. But then every school, every teacher ought to put more on that. That's the, you don't have to start and stop there. You can have your own secret sauce, your own uh, ideas, your own specializations that make your school different. We've tried for so long to create the one size fits all school and all schools being alike sort of the factory model thing. <clears throat> and what we really, I think, need is a portfolio of different options that are right for different kinds of kids headed for different kinds of futures. So what I'd love to see is school boards that say, our job as those responsible for education in an area is to provide a set of opportunities, educational opportunities, that fit our community. 
So there will always be people who want a back to basics kind of approach. There will also always be people who think of how different bumper stickers are, right? I mean, there are all kinds of different views expressed in the world. And if we're going to take all those people and all those kids and put them into one system, it's not going to be right. So I think we're going to find in the future, as technology become more ubiquitous, that we can, in fact, um, uh, individualize. And by that, I don't don't picture kids one on one with you know the gray faces, looking glows coming off screens and everything. There'll be small groups, and there'll be times where you bring groups of kids that are ready for division because they can know how to multiply, they know how to subtract, they know how to add, and they'll get a 20 minute thing from a teacher. And then they'll go off in different directions and maybe play games uh, that are based on that skill and maybe do other things. And so I think that the standards are, there's nothing wrong with standards. It's just there is a, a, there's a little too much emphasis on holding teachers accountable. And that was part of your question, too. We need to, if we're going to have teachers be accountable, we need to give them freedom to do what they think is necessary to get their kids to, to the finish line. Anything to add, David Passmore? Well, Kyle's the expert on this this part of it here, but um, I think that uh, you know, as I was thinking about this, what goes on in schools, people people ought to uh, get ready for this future. And it's easy to say get ready, and you say, well, which specific skills? I'll give you one area where where it will be really important is that uh, we found over over the years when you look at work that people who are able to leverage technology in their work really are the are the groups that move forward so it's not just the skills you have but part of the skill you have is actually working with technology and being able to adapt that being able to plan to use that being able to take that computer and do things with it so if you're the kind of person who says well I'm a little fearful of technology and I I know that's the way the future is going but I'm a paper it. you got to get over it because the the wave on this is going to be people who can complement their skills and leverage and multiply their skills with technology are going to be people in places that are going to be in demand. Rose Baker, my colleague, uh, and I teach a course called Working Close Apart. And the idea with that is to leverage technology to deal with workers in remote locations where costs don't get, get them together, proximity isn't there. But that idea then to be remain productive globally around the clock is really important. And so if you're afraid of technology, well, you know, you got to realize that productive people in the future, professionals, are going to be leveraging technology. That's going to be an important skill to have. Yeah, just, just as the machines <coughs> leveraged our, you know, multiplied our muscular power, these technologies multiply those cognitive capabilities, the abilities to operate high up on that level. So uh, I like you use the word multiply. I see it as an equation where the power of the person times the power of the machine equals the productivity and and here you have if either of those is zero or low you have a low productivity but when both when both are high well here's something that concerns people the, the people who who own the automation are among the wealthiest and and there are lots of people who think that this is going to lead to more inequality well that's that it, that makes sense and it has kind of historically been that way but what we're seeing now is smartphones are really becoming ubiquitous even in places we wouldn't expect this them to true. be mm -hmm. and there have been entrepreneurs that say you know what I can make this much money on a small number of people or I can make just a little bit of money on a great big number of people and so there have been some people who flip that on their heads on that idea on its head and you'll find fishermen in Indonesia that are that have smartphones and are figuring out the best place to take to their sell their fish right and and all kinds of other examples of how technologies they they can pay for themselves now and they are making their way into very unusual places roll that forward five years ten years well, well speaking of, of rolling that forward five or ten years uh, strategic planning at universities usually happens in five-year uh, increments on one hand we've got online education expanding on the other demographics say that we've got a lot of college students today that that number is going to come down there are some who say universities and colleges quit building right now uh, I, I'm wondering what advice you would give to those involved in strategic planning I'll begin with you Kyle Peck I would be in that camp I would say we have beautiful campuses and lots of physical space what I think we need to do now is find ways to incorporate both face-to-face -face and remote students blended in, classrooms in, in real time synchronous conversations like this picture the call-in show but around the edge of the screen picture 
you know, 20 other people <clears throat> that you can see and hear. And the speaker jumps to the middle in, you know, in the big frame. And then when that person, somebody else starts talking, they jump to the middle and, you know, find ways to have a live discussion, even role play where, you know, you're playing the superintendent of schools and David's playing this and someone out there out there is is playing a different role. And we can all do that because we can see each other. We can hear each other. So I think that you need to we need to understand that we don't need to grow our campuses to grow our enrollment. And if we start giving people what they need, which is the ability to participate uh, even in graduate level kinds of experiences in real time, see it, hear it, you know, interact fully interactive ways. I don't mean holograms. We don't need that. But, uh, you know, we, we can do much better. And we, I, I am very optimistic that places like Penn State who get there early and are constantly trying to come up with the next right thing for students are going to be in a good place. David Passmore, what, what advice would you have for those involved in strategic planning? I'd say realize that you will be in a market. You will have pressure. It's when, in a couple of weeks on May 10th, my 68th birthday, I'll be in flowing robes in graduation. I'll have robes on that I suppose somebody wore in the 16th century, and it's cute, okay? And it's and it's and it's kind of makes you feel the ivy. But that isn't the way the world's going to go. I think if we, in strategic planning, we have to realize in that five-year plan that we, we will be in a market. We will not define what we do. We will be responding to market pressures that are due to cost and due to opportunity. Things will change. Things will change. You know, all you have to do is watch the Future of Education <laughs> Epic 2020, which is predicting some jaw-dropping <clears throat> changes in five years. And I'm wondering, there are lots of, lots of people who say that, that's not very realistic. And I, and I recommend everyone who's watching and listening right now to, to watch Future of Education Epic 2020 well, online. Where were we five years ago? I mean, sometimes when I look back at my own, some of my own notes and things from, and things we were doing together five years ago, seven years ago, eight years ago, uh, I guarantee things will look different. All you have to do is look at the history on this, and it's accelerating. So there are there are extreme positions. Some people saying no, it's going to stay just like it is. Other people saying no, it's going to be extremely different, and many universities are going to go away. And the the answer is probably somewhere in between. I think it's further along. Uh, I think that the university will change, and we will have. So there's a. I also recommend a Stanford 2025. They did a visioning thing. Stanford did, and they came up with five different visions of what uh, education might be like. And this, this fact that jobs are going to change, education will be lifelong. And instead of people coming here for four years, which is really turns into six, and then leaving as alumni and not coming back except for, you know, on occasions, that will probably change. And they'll, they talked about one uh, about looping. And you, you come into the university and you get things to head off on a new quest and you go out and you do it and you come back in. And they talked about populi instead of alumni or students. So, so you, you, you have heard people talk about buying a membership to a university and about being part of a flow of information around the topics of your choice where you can learn from because it's all can be recorded in technology. You can learn from people who came before you and learn from people who come into that course after you. So we'll, we'll come up with some new models for what it means to be served by a university. And those are some pretty exciting opportunities. What do you see, David Passmore, as the responsibility today of a university? Well, I think... What does you, it mean to be educated, I guess, in I, the 21st I think, century uh, as well? I think that's a question that goes well beyond the university. As a matter of fact, I'd like to pose that as being bigger than something that a university entails. I mean, we're talking about... We've also always given lip service to the idea of lifelong learning. But believe me, that's got to happen now. You can't go in and get inoculated in four years and then say, I'm done, and go on. So, so the responsibility, I think, for, for learning and all that is much larger. And I think a lot of people, in, even in corporate circles now, we used to talk about training and development and organization development. There's much more focus now on personal career development as the focus. And that kind of gets you out of the, it puts the responsibility where it needs to be for your is, life and your lifelong learning. Uh, what advice, Kyle Peck, would you have for parents and, and, and their, their kids who are struggling right now 
with where to go, what to do. And, and in an age when career counseling, that kind of guidance <clears throat> is more important, it seems, than ever. I'd say be optimistic, be uh, assertive, be uh, self-serving. Uh, there, this is a great opportunity, and lifelong learning doesn't need to sound ominous. Lifelong learning is one of the basic pleasures, really. Uh, I think it's it's one of those things that we will do, and and it, when we when we stop make making learning be something that's oppressive and where you're graded on you know attendance and when you have to have things in on time, when we start really adapting the learning experiences to learners, it's going to be much more pleasant. So for now, think carefully about the future you're preparing for and understand that whether you head in, in direction A, B, or C, think about developing those, those skills that are transferable and that, that transcend disciplines and really take it seriously when you learn, you're learning to write in a discipline and, and think in a discipline and work with other people. And of course, millennials have a different idea about work life. In fact, they put mm -hmm. life work so it's yeah. life bef before work, and, and you were talking about uh, work not being uh, oppressive, but uh, uh, just an extension of, of your life. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we uh, any final thoughts with just a couple of seconds remaining, Kyle? Peck? Just don't don't be frightened. Be uh, be optimistic. Take advantage of the opportunities to learn what you want when you want. All right, you, David Passmore. Think about that educational investment. It's very important. All right. Thank you to tonight's guest, Dr. Kyle Peck, Professor of Education and Co-Director of the Center for Online Innovation in Learning at Penn State, and Dr. David Passmore, Distinguished Professor in the Workforce Education and Development Program at Penn State. We hope you'll join us on Thursday, May 28th, for a special edition of Conversations Live called Caring for Mom and Dad. Thank you all for watching and listening. I'm Patty Satalia. For all of us here at WPSU, have a good night.